Welcome to week 10 in Comp 3077 online. We are just chugging right away. We've got four weeks left of SAM cases and quizzes, and then your custom project in week 13. So week 10, what is going on? This is a required video. This is not going to be quite as long as last week. I know we, we got you pretty good with that case in week nine. That was a long one. Uh, this one won't be as bad. It's going to introduce you to some concepts that can be very useful if you have to do repetitive tasks a lot, if you have to set up sort of fill in the form style of Excel use in an office setting, things like that. So in order to use one of the tools we're going to use, we're gonna start the case by customizing the ribbon, which is a good skill to understand. And then we're gonna be automating tasks with something called a macro. So a macro records what you do while you have the record button on. And then if you run it, it will do everything all over for you again. Like it repeats the tasks, it's a pretty cool tool. Worksheet protection, security settings, comments, which are great. You guys have been experiencing comments since week one, if you actually got anything wrong on any of your SAM cases, because comments are those little red hashes. And when you hover over them, then they show you what you did wrong in that particular cell. When you go back to look over your work, uh, they can be very useful in terms of just data commenting, no pun intended, data, just in general data management and, and passing things around an office and having people, you know, put their two cents in on different statistics, things like that. Data validation is another one where you have people in an office that are putting in data in the sheet that maybe you made and you want to make sure they don't put it in incorrectly. And then we're going to do a little more on defined names and we're going to get into some form tools and some buttons. So some pretty advanced stuff, but it's not that long of a case. And this is a case that won't carry a whole lot of weight on the final test because some of these skills can be a bit quirky. So just to give you a heads up on that, there's a nice list after the week uh, 13 content. There's a final test module in FOL that talks about what, what's covered on the final test and where the most weight is sitting. Um, data validation. There's something that's going to come up with this, I'm sure, this one here, when it gets to the point of putting in a date. And I'm going to make sure everyone understands how to work around it if the language settings on your computer do not accept the date that you're putting in. I'm mentioning that at the beginning here, and it will come up again when we get to that step. So as usual, I'm going to cruise over to week 10 in FOL here. Here's a similar list that we just went over, what we're covering. Again, the cases are worth 4% now. There will be a quiz after this as per usual. Get the case done first, then do the quiz. Always do Sunday night. Let's get rocking. So I have already downloaded the instruction file and open it up here. And the instruction file, you'll notice, has a different file extension. Uh, you don't really change anything you're doing here in terms of how you usually start the case and rename the file, but I did wanna open this case up by showing you how simply you can save a file as a macro-enabled workbook. I'm doing finger quotes right now. Macro-enabled workbook would be a workbook that allows macros to be there. And it's the, the process is as simple as having a standard file, which I have right here, which is just a new file I created, going to save as, and choosing your save as location. Let's choose downloads. And then once we do that, you can go here and choose to make the workbook macro enabled. That is it. So if you're going to have macros in a workbook and you know you're going to create and use this tool, which you're about to learn how to use, that's how you would do that. You didn't have to do that with the case file they provided you because they already did that for you. But probably on the quiz, they're gonna ask you, and this is how you save a variety of different file types in Excel. It's something we actually, I think, only briefly touched upon in the first couple weeks, but you can save Excel as a PDF. You can convert it into Word. You can do lots of stuff. So you would save as macro enabled. It's actually the second option down there. So if we jump back over to Sam, you'll see this file extension ends with an M instead of an X. That just means that it's already been saved for you as a macro enabled workbook. So we're going to go ahead Put that into downloads and we can go over to downloads and open it up. You'll notice the icon is slightly different. And when you open it, you will likely encounter some different 
uh, security alerts because macros are often something. So macros are a form of programming that you can build into an Excel file. And when you have a computer, and this is often the case on a Mac as well, Windows or Mac, if it doesn't know that you meant to have macros in it, it often gives you a warning that, hey, this is macro enabled. Are you sure you're okay with that? So I'm just getting the basic enable editing with this file for me. So that, that might be the same thing you get. You might not get additional security measures, but this is saved as a macro enabled workbook. So we're going to go in and we're going to start working in it. One of the things you may have noticed at the top of the instructions is that before you do, they want to make sure that you have the developer tab up on your ribbon. So this is not a graded step in the case but it is a step that you're gonna to have to complete so you're able to more easily do the macro work that you need to do. So this is something that we're gonna do right now and you can have the file open, you can have just Excel open if you want and then it would open the file with that on there. You can go into file options to do this and under file options, you can customize the ribbon. I think it's even easier to use the quick access button here and so this is on the quick access toolbar where you can customize it. You can also go to more commands. So click that little button, go to more commands. And now we have the same window we had a minute ago. If you go to customize ribbon, this is very simple. You'll see, most of you by default should not have the developer tab turned on. So I'm gonna turn the checkbox on for that. You can see up here right now, I don't have a developer tab up here. Okay, so I'm gonna turn that on. I'm gonna throw add-ons on there too, just in case I add-ins, in case I need them. And once I click OK, the developer tab now appears on my ribbon. So now I'll be able to work with macros without any issue. I have all these different settings in here. One more thing I'm going to ask you to do that is not even mentioned in the case instructions, and I just think this is a best practice to make sure when you know you're using macros that you don't have a computer that continuously tells you there's something wrong with the file and it could be a virus. That's the issue is that macros can be interpreted as viruses by different protocols in your operating systems. But if you tell Excel, it's okay, I know there are macros in here, then it would be fine. So I always, when I'm gonna have a workbook where I'm automating things like this and using macros, I go to macro security and I make sure it this is checked off where it says enable all macros. And that's already checked off on that for my computer because I've done stuff like this before in my Excel. I actually have the developer tab turned on. I just turned it off a second ago so we could do that demonstration. If yours isn't like that, if it's up here for some reason, you wanna check off enable all macros. And then to be super thorough, you could close your file and reopen it again to make sure all those settings are in place. But that was that's kind of an old school thing. You don't need to do that anymore. So at this point, you can start working. So let's get started with step one. So Louis, Paloma is in charge of community relations for Penta Insurance, a health insurance agency in Minneapolis. Louis is coordinating a program, sends off to Penta Insurance in elementary schools. He's developing an Excel workbook. He needs to complete it before the upcoming. He asks you to automate the workbook. Go to the tutor summary. So as soon as you see the, the phrase automate, you know there's something that needs to be done in a file over and over again, or they want to set up a series of tasks that are pre-recorded for the other user to do over and over again so they don't mess it up. Go to the tutor summary worksheet, unprotect it. So there is something that often comes up with worksheets if somebody's put the file together, they don't want you messing around with the settings. They might protect a worksheet and then any cells, when you right click on a cell and you go to format cell and you can see if it's unlocked or locked, any cell that would have that setting, that, that would, those would be the only cells you could edit. If you see right now when I right click, I can't even get into that because the worksheet's protected. So this will be under the review tab. And there's protect workbook, there's share workbook, there's unprotect. And when you unprotect, then the protect button comes on. So it's always under the review tab. And now when I right click, I'm actually able to get in there. So once you protect a sheet, the only cells that would be editable would be the ones that are unlocked. When the sheet isn't protected, it really doesn't matter whether they're locked or not. Uh, but I'm just showing you some side information here. This sheet was protected, so all you have to do for step one is go here, unprotect the sheet. So before we move on to step two, I just want to talk a little bit more about protection. And this applies to both protecting a sheet and an entire workbook. I've discussed what it does. When, when you have cells that you have not gone and unlocked, 
and a sheet is protected, nobody can affect those cells. So for example, if I were to unlock these preemptively before I protected the sheet, then those would be editable if I were to lock the sheet back up. And you can choose the locked and unlocked cells when you go to do it. So when you protect the sheet, you actually have different options here. Um, you can just do formatting, you can protect deleting stuff, or you can just protect all the cells, which is the the most thorough way of making sure nobody can change anything. And if I protect it here without a password, and then somebody comes in um, or with a password and somebody comes in and wants to change stuff, they would only be able to change those ones I just unlocked. I'm going to undo that because we don't want to be doing stuff that Sam's not telling us to do. But I also wanted you to see that when you go to protect and we're only unprotecting here, it does give you the option to protect with a password, with, which means people couldn't turn the protection off unless they had the password. So you truly can keep your data very secure and safe and still share it within the office setting. And you can do that with an entire workbook too. You can password protect the workbook. A um, couple other little notes uh, that I didn't show you. Uh, let's just protect the sheet with no password. So it's protected again. Um, in addition to doing this from the review tab, you can also right click and unprotect the sheet from here. If it's protected, it'll show unprotect. If, if it's not protected, you can protect from there. And on a Mac, one more little Mac note. There's a bunch of Mac notes I have to add to this video when I'm done. Um, when you have a sheet protected on a Mac, it's got a little padlock icon in there next to the sheet. I can't remember if it's on the right or the left, but I saw it on somebody's Mac in one of my lessons, um, which is kind of cool. Just a little more informative in the sense that it's telling you that the sheet is currently protected. When you unprotect it, which is the way you're supposed to leave it for this step, the padlock disappears. And from that point forward, we're going to go and start doing some stuff. So Louis wants to include an eye-catching title on the worksheet, which he shares with others at Penta Insurance. Insert word art. This is just review. We did some stuff like this in week five. Insert word art using fill, dark red text, accent one style. So this will be done on the insert tab all the way to the right. Over by header footer, you'll see these icons are kind of small. They might be more consolidated into the text menu if you have a narrower monitor. I'm always reminding you guys about that. It is the second one over in the top row, I believe. Dark red accent one shadow. Yep, dark red accent one shadow. So once you pick it up, it drops it. Doesn't matter where you're sitting, it drops it wherever. Um, you're going to edit it so it reads Penta Tutoring Program. You can do that right over the cells, don't worry about that. Penta, and I can paste that in. Uh, tutor, I, I don't really need to, I can. Tutoring, I wanna make sure if I do that though, it doesn't affect the formatting. It shouldn't, word art should override any formatting that you're trying to put in there. Yeah, it does, it does paste in with the alternative formatting. So just like when you're pasting into a title box for a chart or something that does have some preset formatting, you'd have to go to keep text only if you wanted to cut and paste, which is fine. And don't add any extra spaces. Do not hit enter. What do we do when we're done putting text into a text box? And that's this particular piece of word art is a text box. You click outside the box. You don't hit enter and start adding extra lines because Sam doesn't like that. Change the text fill of the word art to green accent six, darker 50%. So, oh, I lost my thing. No, just click back on the word art and you'll have the format as usual, all these objects that float around over top of the spreadsheet. You will have custom menus for every one of them. When you click off them, you lose the menu. When you click back in, you get the menu back. We are adjusting shape fill or text fill, text fill. Careful with that, see, text fill right here. So there's, very similar options when you're editing word art and you don't want to choose the wrong one and get it wrong in Sam. You can experiment with those if you want, but just for the purpose of Sam, we are changing the text fill of the word art to green accent six, darker 50. So green, one of these is going to be green, maybe that one, olive green, brown. So light green. Maybe this one, yeah. So that, that looks a little more, um, and I always do these in the summer first. I don't remember that looking so, it's almost like an aqua green. Uh, darker 50 would be the first, uh, no, lighter, darker 25, darker 50. Okay, so it's all the way to the right, farthest column over. 
And you'll notice sitting on the word art, like it's it's only affecting the word that I'm sitting in. So right away, and I did that on purpose because I want you guys to see, you can individually do letters if you wanted to, not even whole words. Uh, if you want the whole thing done that way, highlight the text, done, text fill done with the darker 50. And then we're going to move the word art to row one so that it, fix, it fits within columns A to H. So I'm going to go to row one, A to H. So you can kind of hang it over like that a little bit. That looks nice and clean. And if we scroll down, you'll be able to see the preview of that. Oh, that looks like it stops in G. I don't know why they said A to H if they want it to be. And that won't be a test thing I want to do to see if I get it right or wrong. I mean, they definitely said fits within columns A to H. And I've got it within columns A to H. So the fact that it's over here and inside of G, I mean, it still fits within columns. Oh, yeah, it's still spilling into H. See the object? The object box is still going into H. I suspect even if I move mine over a bit, it'll still be marked correctly. And you'll find out soon enough when I submit it. So that was step number two. Step number three, Louis created a macro to insert a plain worksheet title and then attach the macro to the insert title button. He no longer needs the button delete the button in the range H5 to H6. So this is a cool thing. Once you build a macro on the developer tab, if we go back to that and we click on macros, there's a few macros in here that will perform a bunch of basic tasks just by running them. And you can run them simply by going to where I just went into the macro menu and clicking on the macro and running it. You don't necessarily need a button, but a button is another cool way to do it, which is also done from the developer tab. And it's under the insert here, you can insert buttons. And you can attach macros to buttons. One of these he just doesn't need. So now I, I want you guys to stop. Don't do anything yet until you see exactly how I do this next step because I think they, they've they done this on purpose to sort of give students a bit of a runaround. You went and created this word art and put that all in there. And now they're telling you to delete this button. So this button, do not click on it. This button was put in there to run a different macro that would fill in this top section in a different way. And if you left click on the button, it will run the macro. Uh, before I move on to show you exactly how to do it, and you gotta follow these instructions carefully, I decided I would add this little clip where I'm gonna deliberately run the macro by accident like I'm telling you not to do. So here's what'll happen. If you go in here and don't do this, I hope you guys aren't watching the video without audio and then you go and do this. If you go in here and you left click the macro, this is what it does. It runs this other macro that is meant to put something into the background there with a bunch of different background colors. So here's, here's how you would fix that. You would get your mouse in there so you could grab the green one. See if you get your, it should pick that up first and then drag it out of the way and put it over here. That's what you just made. Then go into those cells and clear all. So that was a merge and center that, that went over there all the way to I. Well, actually, I don't know if it was a merge and center. It might've just been, whatever it was, just get into those cells, clear all. Now it's gone. Go down here to your word art and put it and get it placed back in there. Make sure the edges of the word art box are not touching the top or the bottom. Get a little more over to the left. You don't have it have to have it as far over as you see in the picture, as I already explained. And that's how you would fix it if you accidentally left click it. Now I'm going to cut back into the video where I'm giving you the precise instructions on how to not do that. So you have to follow my instructions here very carefully to know that even if you're in the developer tab and you go to design mode, which is meant for you to be able to edit more of this automated type of stuff without it executing, if you left click on the button, it'll still execute and it'll fill in cells A to H with a dark green background and a different word art and you can't undo it. So at that point, then you have to basically just close the file and well, you could reformat the cells and, and redo the step you just did, but it would be much easier if instead you go to the button and you right click, right click. As soon as you right click, it highlights the button for you. And at that point, you don't, I mean, you can cut, but you can even just hit here. You can click off the uh, right click menu and just hit delete. Oh, how did I get into edit text? I didn't choose to do that. I must have get into, that's also how you edit text, by the way. There you go, I showed you two things. Um, and you right click and delete. 
Okay, you right click. If you left click, it will run the macro, even if you have design mode turned on. I don't know if that's just a quirky thing with the settings on my machine, but you want to get rid of that button without running it. If you accidentally run the macro, all of this will fill in with green and you basically just have to backtrack. It's, it's easy enough to fix. To get rid of that button, you want to right click and you could right click cut would probably be the safest way to do it. I prefer to right click and then exit the little menu and hit delete, but I got into the text menu first. So it's a bit of a quirky step. It totally works the way it should. I think they're doing that on purpose so that you go through all this work and pick your settings for that. And then if you don't know how to delete a button, which is by right clicking, if you accidentally left click and run it, then you see you have to redo it. So step number four, Louis plans to print the tutor summary worksheet before he goes. So we're gonna record a macro here. So, and that would have run a macro uh, there if we would have seen it run, but we're gonna do our own. And to record a macro, we're going to go and start recording and we're going to use the exact name we have here. Now, this is not going to take long. This is every time we get a SAM case where you're recording a macro, the things you're doing while the macro is recording are very simple. So with the macro recording, click the file tab and then click print, change the print orientation, change the scaling, return to the tutor summary worksheet, stop recording. Seems really simple, right? But if you screw one thing up while you're recording, you have to go back, get rid of the macro and then fix it and put the right one in there. So this is not a long case, but it's easy to mess up if you don't follow the steps precisely. So we're gonna to go to that developer tab we added and we're gonna go here to record macro. We're gonna paste in the name. Did they say to make a keyboard shortcut? Nope, they didn't. So record macro, store it in the current workbook. So that's store macro in this workbook. They don't give you a description for it, so you don't need to get a description in there. They've kept this very simple. The previous case, for the previous version of Excel with macros, they made it a lot more complicated. So you just put the name in and click OK. Now, as soon as you click OK, you'll see up in the left corner, it says stop recording. Don't hit that. I'm just showing you that whenever you see that, that means you are recording. So moving my mouse around isn't going to be part of the macro. It's any hard action that I take. So the first thing they want you to do is go to file and go to and go to print. They don't tell you to do it with the keyboard shortcut. And if you do, you'll probably get it wrong because that's not what Sam said to do. So go file, go print. Now with the print menu up on the sheet, change the page orientation to landscape. So page orientation, landscape. Change the scaling setting to fit sheet on one page. I do this all the time, fit on one page fit sheet on one page, scaling. So these are some cool print options we haven't explored much either. Uh, there, change, my computer's lagging a bit. Return to the tutor summary worksheet. Stop recording the macro. Didn't say to print. Return to the tutor summary, stop recording. That is your macro. That, I repeat, that is it. If you end up printing or doing something that shouldn't have been included in there, well, we will be playing around in this program called Visual Basic a, a little bit, and you could edit it in there. The easiest way to fix it is to go to Macros, click on the one you just made, uh, which is Print Setup, uh, go here, delete it, and just do it again correctly. That is the way you're supposed to do it, so I'm gonna leave mine the way it's, that's literally it. That, and you can be formatting text during a macro, you can be inputting text into a certain area, you can do all kinds of stuff with macros. And it's just a matter of knowing the series of steps you want to do and how you want to do them and remembering to start and stop recording at the right time. So now just to make it simpler to run it, we can go here and assign it to this button. So you can right click the button. If you left click, it won't do anything because there's nothing assigned to it yet. Assign macro and take the thing you just made click on it to assign it to it, click OK. And now when you click that button, it will run the print setup. Now I'm in, I'm in design mode, so if I go back out and click here, I could run it. I don't need to do that unless it says to, which it does not. So this is just showing you how to make a really simple recording and then go back and set it up. So what is a macro? A macro uh, as defined by Excel, and I did pull this up here that one. If 
you have tasks in a macro that you do repeatedly, you can record them to automate the task. So it's exactly what we've been talking about. And that's all we're doing. This is a very simple example of it, but it more than anything, we just want you to know in this course that this technology is available. Step number six, go to the tutor worksheet. So we're switching worksheets. Let's go to the tutor records worksheet. Stop bouncing around here. Where Louis tracks tutor assignments, yada, yada, yada. We're going to do some data validation. So this is where you might run into something annoying. And I'm going to show you how to fix it in the context of this step. So C5 to C18, create data validation that applies. So you can only put dates into this range. So you can highlight more than one cell when you're doing data validation. And we're going to do C5 to C18. And we're going to go to data. And over here, data validation. So what this does is it prohibits people from putting things in there that shouldn't be in there based of course on the criteria that you set so you can set it to a number and say it can be between greater than equal than whatever you can do lists of text that has to be from some kind of list you can do date so if we do date we can set it to be in between two dates now whether or not the way sam gives you the date in this format is going to work is almost irrelevant because if you just type out the long date you can't go wrong. So this is March 22nd, 2021 to May 14th, 2021. Just type it out. March 22nd, comma, with a single space, 2021, to May 14th, comma, single space, 2021. Just don't put these dates in there because the odds are much more likely that that format is not going to work based on your language settings. Whatever language settings you have, if you type out the actual long date, which by the way is how they have it in the cell anyway, that will work. So that those are my settings, March 22nd, and we're typing it out in the long format so we don't have to worry about the format. Create an input message that says tutoring start date. Okay, so if you're sitting on the cell and you're ready to input something, that message will come up. So we go to input message, tutoring start date. Did they give me a title? As the title, okay. Should read a little further in the instruction there. And the message itself is enter the date to start tutoring with the period. You can tell because they made it bold. Then in case there's an error, we will make the error alert invalid message. We can type that one right. Invalid date. Jeez, I really should stick to my own rules and always be cutting and pasting. Enter a date between March. So the system is obviously going to be very sensitive to you having one wrong letter or a space or something like that. So make sure you do put exactly what they're asking you to do. They don't say to change any other settings. So you can leave that to show error alert. You do have some different stop settings. There's a warning one and an info one. They said to leave it or they didn't say it. No, no, they did say create stop style alert. And there you go. Click OK. And you've created a data validation. So when you sit in there, you can see each one I sit in there and says start tutoring date, enter the tutoring date. When I go and put in a date like June 23rd, 2022, it says, hey, that's not right. It has to be between March 22nd and May 14th. So that's how data validation works. It's a very cool tool. It's very easy to use. The only thing you might run into there is trying to type the dates in the way they formatted them in step number six. When I've shown you already, you need to type in the long dates. Louis wants to make sure all the dates entered in the tutoring state uh, date column are valid. So identify and correct any invalid dates. So in C5 to C18, circle invalid data. So this is built into the data validation menu, highlight the same range. And you could see that they've already kind of hinted to you by, by having those little hashtags there that there's something wrong there. It left the data in because you put the data validation on there after. But if you highlight the, the cells and go to data validation on the, the, the data menu, sorry, I'm really speaking there, circle invalid data. It circles the two that need to be corrected. Do not undo the fact that you have that circled because that setting will be checked by Sam and simply change them to March 24th, 21 and March 26th, 21. And again, 
type in the full date exactly how I showed you. It's the month and day, comma, space, and the year. So this should be March 24th, comma, space, 2021, enter. And next one should be March 26th, comma, space, 2021, enter. Done. Hey, the, the, the date format that they give you may not work, but they're just assuming you pick up on the fact that they're running long dates in this particular case. Go to the two to registration worksheet. So we're moving along pretty good here. Save your file. Tutor registration. And with the tutor registration worksheet, we're going to open the Clearform macro in Visual Basic. So this is stepping it up into the level of becoming a coder, but at a very, very simple, basic level. So Visual Basic is Microsoft's code program. And technically speaking, just because we went to this worksheet, you didn't have to be here to open that up. And you can go to the developer tab, go to macros, and the clear form macro is right here. You could have done that from any worksheet. We're just preemptively getting to this worksheet. And they want you to open it up in Visual Basic and delete the values C4 to C8, but specify the range. The macro should delete, but specify the range C3. So let's take a look at it. Okay, if we click on the macro and click edit, it will show us what it's doing. Now, I realize you guys aren't coders, but you don't need to be coders to sort of interpret very, very basic data. So actually, this is a lot simpler than you think it is. If you read what's happening here, it's saying macro is using this to delete the data from here on this sheet in this range. All they're telling you to do is fix the range. They, they're using this step specifically C4 to C8 to get you to go into Visual Basic and see how easy it is to edit little things like that. And once you're done, you can simply click this little Excel button to go back to Excel and you're back in there. Now, by making the edit I just made right here, I kind of jumped the gun to part B a little bit because the instructions through this step, step eight, are very uh, hand-holdy, I guess, if we want to call them that. that. You don't actually have to do much for some of the steps. Uh, the first step was fundamentally just opening up Visual Basic so you could see the macro. So to complete the first step, what we very simply did was we went to macros we clicked on the macro we wanted to see the code for, we click edit. And then as we do that, it opens the Visual Basic window here, which is still open. And then you can switch back and forth from Excel to Visual Basic by doing this. So part B says, put this exact code in between these two lines of instructions, which I've already done um, as I kind of worked ahead in part A there. And you don't have to redo the whole part. You just change the range part from C3 to C7 to C4 to C8. Now it says scroll down to display the code for the add macro tutor. If you go into this drop down here in the code that you brought up for that macro, you can go to the add tutor macro, or like the instruction said, you can just scroll down. And this macro, as they said, will now work correctly. So part C, you don't have to do anything other than look at it. And now you can save everything you did and close the Visual Basic Editor. So we hardly had to do anything between 8, A, B, and C. We basically just changed the range at the beginning from C3 to C7 to C4 to C8. It's just introducing you to this platform where the coding is done. You can save from here. And instead of switching back to Excel, you can just close the X in the upper right corner. And you're back in here. And now, as part of this step as well, they want you to assign the clear form macro to the clear form button so that Louie and his staff can use the button to clear the form. And then use the clear form macro to clear the form. And by doing that, you're testing the macro. So right click on the button, assign macro, just like we did on the previous uh, two worksheets ago. Go to clear form, click OK, and let's click off it and then click the button. Clears the macro or clears the data from the cells, which is what the macro was to do. And by switching the range, it cleared the proper cells. Had you not switched the range, you'd still have some data left there in, uh, in C8. For number nine, they have a description here at the beginning that is 
in summary, just explaining to you what this other macro is about to do. So there's this other macro called the add tutor macro. And what it does is it copies the data from the cells on the worksheet we're on right now, and then transposes them and puts them into the next blank row in the worksheet previous. And we're gonna make a button for this to work like that. So we've assigned macros to buttons already twice now. Now we're actually gonna make a button, which is quite easy to do. And we're gonna jump over to this worksheet. You can kind of be sitting wherever. I think it would be ideal to sit in that particular cell. It does say in column C, so I would just kind of sit there and line it up. But it doesn't really matter where you're sitting because once you go back to the developer tab and you go to insert, Form control button is the first option there. Nothing happens, but if you put your cursor back over the worksheet, you could see it's got the cross cursor now, which means you're ready to draw something. So at that point, you can kind of just approximately draw it out. And don't worry about the size because they're gonna have you resize it in a minute, but first you're going to assign the add tutor macro to it by clicking on it. As soon as you draw the button, it asks you to assign the macro. You click OK and you've got it sitting there. So now, like so many other things we've had in Excel, sitting on this floating object over a worksheet, you have your own format tab. So click on the format tab and you're going to change the sizing dimensions as they were provided in the instructions. If you happen to have a situation like we did last week where this is not set to inches and you're concerned about doing the conversion to inches and it might not be precise enough for Sam, as I showed you last week, you can drop down in here. You can go to more commands and go to advanced. And if you scroll down to display, the ruler units are right there. Just a few lines down under display. And I've changed mine from centimeters to inches. The college gave me the machine and it was set to centimeters and it has stayed inches after I closed and reopened Excel. So that's good. So I'm gonna go in here and you don't have to worry about keeping the quote marks that indicate inches, you can just highlight over it and type them in and type in the number and it will put the quotes right back in there for you. So 0.3 inches high, 1.8 inches wide. I find it odd that the button, when I, when I size it like that and I go to the, I always check out when I see inconsistencies, I, I think it'd look better if both buttons were the same size. And when you go down to the instructions, they do look like the same size. But Sam, nowhere in the instructions, tells you to resize the other one. So sometimes with some of the imagery, like the fit, the final figures, they are a little bit inconsistent from what it always go with what the instructions say to do. And it said very clearly 0.3 by 1.8. So that's what we're going to do. Align the new top of the button with the other one. So we can, it's, it's still sort of sitting there. As soon as I made it, it stays like right clicked. Like it stays with the button so I can I can left click and drag and drop it around. So I'm gonna get the tops aligned up as close as I can get them and it's not gonna be overly picky about that. Then I'm going to edit the text to say add tutor. And then Just notice it told you to assign the macro at the end, which, um, no, we're gonna do that. Well, we, we can do that too. Um, edit the text first. Text will say, add tutor. You don't need the underscore in there. That's for when you're naming the macro. As soon as you're done editing text, you click outside the box, just like any other text box. Right click it again, and not right on the text. So right click the box again, so you can go to format control. And under there, you can actually edit what type of text it is. And from there, we are going to make it Calibri 11 point if necessary. Um, it is not Calibri 11 point. So I'm going to make it Calibri 11 point. Um, note color changes, nothing like that click OK. Uh, that's something you could also do from the Home tab. If you double click on there and edit text, that should mark it too. I don't think it's like one of those things last week where you had to do it from that certain spot in the pivot table or it didn't work. So click outside the box. We've edited the font. We've put the font in. We've edited the font. 
Now it says assign the add tutor macro to the new button. Uh, I have 2019. I don't know if that's the same as 365. It automatically prompted me to assign it as soon as I made the button. If I right click on the button and assign macro, I can see it already has the add tutor macro assigned. Um, I can do it again just to be thorough. It had the file name in there because it had done it when the file name, oh yeah, so that's, it probably does want you to do that. Um, I think it did that because I had more than one Excel file open. So even though it pre-assigns it, I would assign it again just to be thorough. And then you know you'll have that correct. Now for step 10, we're gonna test this out. And we already know from previous weeks, on many occasions when we have a set of cells in Word and we have a set of cells in Excel, which we need to do, what we need to do is get that data into these cells. We can very simply, to save ourselves some time and some typing, copy those five cells in Word, go over to Excel, highlight those same five cells that we're going to put it into, match destination formatting, and we're good. Now, I, I have to admit to you guys, this took me several times to figure out what was going on at the end here, and that's despite me doing these in the summer and getting the hundreds. Um, of course, I tend to forget about these language setting issues. So these cases are all made in the States, and this is an American date format. And when this macro is going to be run, it's going to show up here. And when it shows up here, it should match the format of the dates that are already here, which are in the long date format. So the easiest way to get around this, and this is not in the instructions, I'm telling you right now, this is what you need to do. And if you do it wrong the first time around, you can simply go to this sheet, clear the new record that'll be in here, just delete it and then go and do this all over again, step 10. But when you get to step 10 and you paste it in, before you run the macro, before, you're gonna type out the long date, March 22nd, comma, space 2021, and hit enter. Assuming you type out the long date, when you run the macro, then the long date shows up here, and then it says you've run the macro correctly. Even though this has nothing to do with the macro, it has to do with language settings. So. I think it could also be fixed simply by running the macro and then changing the date here. Um, that would probably fix it as well. I just, I don't think it would hurt you guys to run the macro one more time if you don't get it right the first time around. So when I click this button, it will take all this data, transpose it from a columns to a row across, from a column to a row across. And because I've already put the long date format in, it's gonna put the proper date in there and then it's gonna be marked correct. So I click it. It runs it, it's taken it out of there, it's transposed it into here, and it's cleared the cells at the same time. Because remember in the previous instruction, it explained that the add tutor macro runs the clear data macro, clear form macro. And now I've got the long date in there. And now when I save my file and close it, you probably noticed at the beginning of the case, I had also neglected to change the name, uh, which is something I never do, but I mean, I always remember to change the name. It's the first step in every case. It's okay if you do it at the end. You guys know if you don't do it, Sam will alert you to that right away that it's not been changed. And I go into Sam, I pick it up. You can see I've already submitted it three times because it took me three times to figure out what it Sam was saying that I wasn't doing right with the macro. The macro was totally fine. It was just the way it wanted the date format. So when I get the report submitted now, and look at it, it will be 100%. Because every other step I had done in the video, I had already done correctly. It, and I had done the last step correctly. It just wasn't liking the date format. As I demonstrated to you guys, it's a very easy fix. And as long as you do it that way, you will end up with 100% just like me. So that wasn't too bad of a case, um, especially in terms of timing. Some very neat tools. Take your time with it. I mean, it's, well, you're already done now if you're at the end of the video with me, so uh, good job. Now, hang on one more second. I got to throw this in at the end here. Uh, I don't usually do this either, but this is something that will be on the quiz. It would be under the review tab. The review tab has an area for comments. So comments are something that definitely fall into the veil of what we've been doing on this particular case, where we're monitoring and forming. We're sort of just trying to keep tabs on the content of an Excel file. And comments are something that you have seen before. Comments are not graded in this case, but they will pop up on the quiz. Um, sometimes they're just evaluated in the quiz and not the case. 
Uh, they are a way where you can add this sort of external text box that comes up, but when you're hovering over something. So let's say that cell, this was a really good example, actually. I wanted everybody who was working on this file to know to input the long date format when they put the date in here from the data they got from the system or whatever. I can sit in that cell and add a comment and it will start by being authored by me. You can actually adjust that. I can change that to, you know, Mike Sloan on November 7th. Hey guys, reminding you to make this date a long date format. And I can make, I can unbold that. Like most of your standard keyboard shortcuts work right inside the comment box. I can get rid of that hard enter. I can click off the box and that little red hash mark will stay there to show me there's a comment there. And whenever I hover over it, it will show me what's in there. I can actually have it set up so that if there are comments on a sheet, I can just turn them on so I can show them the whole time. Um, if they're not on like that, if they're that way, it will still show up when you hover over it. So it's a really useful tool. I needed to put in there as part of this case because it's definitely something we want you to be aware of using. And again, I keep saying that you've seen these and you're experiencing these. Those would only be those of you that get things wrong on the cases, which is pretty much everybody, at least a few times. You're not going to get 100% every time. And the comments are how Sam actually tells you in a cell that you did something wrong. So many of you over the course of the first 10 weeks have already figured this out, that you just hover over them to get them there. And if you want to add your own comments, that's how easy it is to do. Under the review tab, you can add. And then if you have a comment in there, you can edit the comment. You can, of course, right click. And if there's a comment in there, you can delete it. You can edit it. Very easy tool to use. A lot of the same behaviors as other stuff in Excel. Um, and it is part of our week 10 learning. So we just needed to put that in there. But at this point, your case is already graded. You should be good to go. Thanks for being here for week 10. Uh, we will see you next week.